There's got to be something we can do. Wait a minute. You got any money? Because I got a plan. <sighs> Yikes. Hey, folks, this is Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards. And how many of us GMs out there haven't had an opportunity to play a game on short notice? You know, it's always a little bit stressful trying to put together something that's going to be engaging and fun for your friends uh, without having a good amount of time to plan it properly. Well, at least that was the case uh, back whenever we had to rely just on Dungeons & Dragons to do that. But with the wealth of other systems that are available in this, what I would call the second golden age of RPGs, we have a lot of options. One of the ones that I'm going to talk about today is going to be the Index Card RPG. This is the Master Edition of it. This game was created by Runehammer, and it is a great universal system. Uh, it's very well balanced for uh, experienced gamers or brand new gamers. You can teach the concepts in just a few minutes, and you can generate obstacles and villains on the fly and you can keep your players engaged and having fun throughout the experience. On top of that the book has a lot of great advice that you can bring back and use in your properly planned uh, fully fleshed out games of Dungeons and Dragons or whatever your flavor of the month RPG is. So without further ado let's talk about some index card RPG. Master Edition by Runehammer. First thing I want to do is talk about some of the core mechanics of the Index Card RPG or the IC RPG as I will refer to it from now on. And the first thing is the target. Now, those of you that have played other modern uh, RPGs, you're going to be familiar with target numbers, but with the IC RPG, the target is a little bit different because it influences everything that happens in the scene. You have one target number for everything in the scene. Here's a simple example of play in the ICRPG. In this case, our heroes are trying to free the Dungeon Master from the evil Venture, who sits on his throne across the room from the uh, reluctant heroes. So in the back, we have Hank by the gate. We have Diana by the pit of acid. We have Presto and Eric by the statue, we have Sheila and Bobby and Uni over by the lever. So, in this scene, I would assign this a target of 16. So, in this scene, the target number that they need to roll to be successful to, say, disarm the trap that is on the statue is a 16. If they wanted to hit Venger with an attack, the target number is 16. And if Diana wanted to jump over the acid pit, the target number would be, yeah, you guessed it, 16. Now, I know that that might sound a little bit blasphemous to those of you that have played a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons or other RPGs, but keep in mind, this keeps the game moving fast, and it keeps it very straightforward and not confusing for the players. In the course of the game, they will be doing simple checks, which is a single roll, or they will be doing complex checks, which involves making the simple roll and then doing an effort roll afterwards. Now, effort is a unique mechanic to the ICRPG system. So let's say that the players want to attempt to knock down this statue for whatever reason, that's probably not going to be a one-hit kind of action. That's going to be a complex action. So when they do that, they're going to have to roll effort. So they'll roll their normal 16, the target number for the scene, to hit, and then they'll have to roll an appropriate die for whatever tool or skill they're using to knock down this statue. So in the ICRPG, that is the die type that you use based on what you are uh, doing the task with. So if you're doing something with your bare ha hands, it's probably going to be a d4. If you're using basic tools uh, or a weapon, it's probably going to be a d6. If you're using firearms, it's going to be a d8. If you're using magic or lasers or energy, it's going to be a d10. 
And if you get a critical, you're going to roll whatever the appropriate die type is, plus a d12. And you're going to apply that amount of effort to the number of hearts of the task. Now, the hearts could be a hit point or hit points for an enemy, or it could just be the amount of effort that you have to do to, say, knock down this statue or pick a lock, or whatever the case may be. Each heart represents 10 points of effort that must be utilized uh, in order to defeat that individual task. So, unlike most RPGs where you just roll damage against an enemy when you're attacking him, in the IC RPG, you can actually use a similar system called effort in order to make complex tasks that uh, can actually create a, a better sense of tension uh, because of the uh, amount of effort that it takes to defeat them. So in this scene, a simple task, a, a base, or a, uh, yeah, simple task, might be jumping over the pit. Diana would roll a single, uh, a single check and try to hit the target number in order to do that. But whenever the rogue, Sheila, is trying to uh, move the lever, maybe that is a more complex action and may require multiple effort rolls in order to be ultimately successful in that task. There is one more bit of information that's important to know regarding these checks, and that is that you can modify the scene target number for easy actions by reducing it by three, or difficult actions by increasing it by three. But in general, any actions are going to typically use the standard target number for the scene in question, no matter what it is you're doing. You probably noticed that I was using some cards to represent the different areas of the map in the last section there, and those are actually uh, specially made ICRPG cards that have different pieces of artwork on them, and they can be used similar to like Rory's Story Cubes to create an adventure on the fly, or you can plan ahead and just use them to represent whatever it is you want your adventurers to be tasked with defeating in your adventure. Of course, we all know that half the fun of any RPG is in the character creation. And in this, ICRPG definitely does not fail. It's got a simple and somewhat familiar system that is just different enough to keep it fresh. So you'll notice that all the character uh, attributes are the same as those found in Dungeons & Dragons. Strength, Dex, Con, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. But instead of rolling an arbitrary number that you'll ignore after you actually establish the modifiers, in this game, you actually just get the modifiers. You get six points to distribute amongst your six scores. You can put them all in one. You can uh, put one in each or any combination thereof. On top of that, the life form or race that you choose, you're going to uh, get some extra points for that as well. And then you're going to be able to distribute four points into the various dice of effort based on what kind of tasks that you are doing. There are no classes in ICRPG, but that's kind of a name-only sort of thing because there are types which fill the role of classes uh, only in minor ways, though. They're not nearly as restrictive or boxing in as a class is. Uh, you can still pretty much do anything you want just with a few simple options, and a creative GM can easily create anything that is not represented in the available classes in the existing Master Edition of the ICRPG book. Because the session I'm going to be running on short notice this weekend is going to be a fantasy campaign, this represents a character using the Alfheim uh, rule set. The uh, standard ICRPG book comes with full, uh, full settings for Alfheim, Warpstone, Ghost Mountain, Vigilante City, and Blood and Snow. Those uh, respectively represent the genres of fantasy, space opera, weird west, supers, and cavemen. Yes, that's right, cavemen. Each one of these different uh, worlds has a uh, somewhat fleshed out and interesting story to go along with the different areas. It gives you a very good starting point to have a campaign or a one-off game. It also gives some specific rules for playing in those settings. For example, in Vigilante City, it goes over the rules for having superpowers, and in Warp Shell, it goes over some more of the technological and vehicle-related rules 
giving you a good base for anything you want to design from there. I mentioned earlier about how easy it was to design an adventure on the fly with this system, and a lot of that boils down to the ease at which you can create obstacles and enemies. This is all it takes to create an enemy stat block. You need a number of hearts. Each heart is worth 10 hit points. You need uh, to have whatever their bonus is to any rolls that they make. And then you can add some actions or traits that give them some specific and interesting abilities. For example, you might give a dragon uh, fire breathing. The book itself has a uh, very nice bestiary with some variety of creatures from different genres. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things about it, because it's very stat light, it's very easy to reskin these for a different uh, purpose. For example, uh, you could take one of the undead uh, that has uh, like the banshee. Uh, the banshee's scream. You could easily reskin that uh, to be an alien because the banshee has claws, the alien has claws. Uh, the banshee has a scream effect that damages the psyche of the, uh, the enemy. It could be a psionic attack for the alien. And the character or the uh, the players are going to be none the wiser, and it's just going to fit because it is such a simple system to run enemies, but yet it is still deep enough to have some crunch there. Probably the most valuable section of the book, in my opinion, is the GM section, because this is a real good toolkit that you can utilize in any game that you run. There's sections in here that go over the philosophy of good uh, game design and good adventure design, ways to keep your players engaged and interested, and there's a creed that you can uh, look at that gives kind of the philosophy behind being a GM and what, what you should be looking to accomplish. There's also a section with uh, different obstacles and tactics to insert into your adventures to create a more uh, realistic and interesting adventure for your players. Lastly, there is a section that is specifically about borrowing rules or chunks of rules from this RPG to utilize in different RPGs to make them seem fresh and interesting and just to uh, clean up some of their clunkier spots. For those of you that aren't satisfied with a simple magic system that just involves a few spell lists, there's also an alternative spell system in the back under the section titled Magic. And with that, you're going to have the option for uh, mercurial mishaps, making da uh, magic dangerous and strange. Uh, there's going to be the option to create spells, as well as a, a whole other list of additional spells. And there's going to be some specific loot that is related to pursuit of the magical arts. If you're going to be running a uh, campaign with a lot of in-depth magic users, this would be the route to go. But otherwise, the one that is shown in the Alfheim section is going to be suitable for most. At the end of the book, there's an absolute plethora of tables that are useful for your game, whether you're playing a space opera, a fantasy game, a Weird West game, or anything in between. Uh, there are several different tables for things such as monster motivations. Not every monster is just sitting around waiting to fight some uh, heroes that come along. There's also different loot tables for all the different genres. And there's my favorite, the Bizarre Loot. This is actually the back of Presto's character sheet, because in the, the one-shot adventure that I'm going to be running, that is going to be the effect of Presto's hat. They're going to be able to draw a random piece of Bizarre Loot and see what happens. Just like in the animated series, it probably isn't going to be all that useful most of the time, but with a creative set of PCs, maybe they can come up with something that's going to be exactly what they need to save the day. Now, on top of the 400 and some odd page uh, book that you get with the Master Edition of the ICRPG, if you buy the PDF copy, you also get a couple more files, one of which is 160-ish pages of adventures. Now, given that this is a low uh, stat block, uh, simple rule system, the adventures don't take very many pages, but they're all well-written and engaging, and I'm actually going to be using a modified version of one of these this weekend for my one shot for my players. And here are some final thoughts on the ICRPG. This game is well designed. It's clear that the author has a love for RPGs in general, and he wants to just add and make the community better overall. 
even if I wasn't going to ever use this as an RPG itself, the book would be worth it just for the tools and the philosophical comments that Runehammer gives us in this. Now, <clears throat> if you are going to be playing this, I think there's a lot of meat on the bones here, and you could potentially run long campaigns in several different genres, and I think your players are really going to appreciate the familiarity and also the ease of entrance and the, the quickness of play represented by this game system. So if you're looking for a D&D alternative, try out the ICRPG. Until next time, this has been Justin with Books, Bricks, and Boards. Good gaming, and God bless.